who love Alabama, but that's out there. <laughs> My name is Derek, by the way. I have the privilege of being the pastor here at First Baptist Tillman's Corner, and I am so excited to get to John chapter 2, and that's where we're going to spend our time together today. I do want to encourage you. Some of you may not know we have a Sunday evening service at 6 p.m. I want to encourage you to come back for that tonight. We'll be doing a time of concentrated prayer and uh, in worship, and so I'm really excited about that. We've uh, decided this year as much as possible to set aside the second Sunday night of every month to do just that, to pray. We are trying to pray more than ever before this year, and so we are uh, going to do that this evening, so I would encourage you to come back. And those of you who are joining us online, uh, it's a joy to have you every week. It happened just this morning. Somebody said, Pastor, I've not been able to be here, but I've been able to watch online. And so we are so thankful that uh, whatever prevents you from being with us in person, you're here or whatever, wherever you may be. Maybe you're not anywhere near the Mobile area. We do want to encourage you to find a local Bible-believing church that you can fellowship with. Uh, and uh, you're always welcome to join us here, but your primary place where you get fed should be in a local Bible-believing church in your own community or as close to it as possible. John chapter 2, again, is where we're going to be. Uh, and today's passage is a beautiful story about a wedding. It's the passage that lets us know that God's okay with weddings. In fact, he likes them a lot. Je uh, Jesus goes to a wedding in John chapter 2. Uh, I want to take you back to your wedding. Those of you who have had a wedding, not everyone has, but uh, I want to take you back to your wedding. And something that I always tell couples in, in planning when we're doing premarital counseling, we'll talk just a little bit about the ceremony. And I'll always say, hey, something's going to go wrong at your wedding. Okay? I don't know what it will be, but something will go wrong. No matter how well you plan it, no matter how many times you kind of go through the whole wedding deal, something is going to go wrong in, in your wedding. And it's okay. In fact, whatever it is that goes wrong in your wedding will be the thing that you actually talk about 10 and 20 years later. It'll be the thing that you laugh about. It'll be the thing that's memorable to you. It will make your wedding better. So in the moment, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Uh, one of the things that didn't go as we had planned at our wedding was uh, was during our reception. We uh, we had uh, a we got married at a church that didn't really have a place for a, a reception, and so we had to decide: Are we going to drive somewhere else for the reception, or are we going to try to do something else? And so uh, we came up with a brilliant idea, and it was a brilliant idea. We we said, you know what? Why don't we rent one of these big tents and put it in the parking lot, and we'll have our reception in the tent, and it'll be fantastic. And it was, I, I want to tell y'all, it was a brilliant idea in February when we were planning the wedding. Now, in August, when we had the wedding in North Alabama at 100 plus degrees, it was not a great idea. And I remember standing in that tent, Lindsay and I are standing there, and everyone's coming by and, and congratulating us and all those kinds of things. And I said, Lindsay, take a good look around this tent right here. All these people who are standing in here, all these people who are seated at these tables, let me tell you, these people love us, and we can count on these people. Uh, because if not, they would not be standing in this tent. These are the people that when the chips are down, we can count on these people. You know, weddings are very different in our culture than they are in other cultures. In our culture, it is that. It's all about coming and supporting and encouraging the couple. And uh, we, we come to come around that family at that time and kind of rally around them. But in other cultures, especially in Eastern cultures, the wedding is so much more important for the family that's hosting it. The wedding is the family's opportunity to say, this is who we are and to host an event in which they really serve the community. It's, it's almost 180 degrees different for Eastern cultures than it is for us. And, it, and it's a big deal. And hospitality and shame and honor, it's all wrapped up into a wedding. And the question of can you rightly support your guests? Can you be a host that has enough to provide for your guests? This is where Western culture and Eastern culture are very different from one another. I learned this uh, in China as we were seated around a table and we're, we're eating and just food keeps coming and coming and coming. And of course, we're raised in the cultural South. What are you supposed to do? You clean your plate. The way that you honor your host is you clean your plate. Well, in Eastern culture, the way that you honor your guest is you make sure that no matter how much they eat, the table is always full. It's a way of saying we have so much that we can take care of our guests and it doesn't even look like the food has been touched. Well, Eastern culture 
culture and Southern uh, American culture did not mix well as, you know, we're just eating and eating and eating. And finally, uh, this was the line that, that ended it all. If you'll stop eating, they'll quit bringing food. <laughs> so, you know, we're relieved to hear that. All right. But here's the thing. You need to know that behind the scenes in a traditional Chinese home or even in a modern Chinese home or in a Middle Eastern home, as you start to eat, if they start to run out of food, they'll go to relatives, they'll go to neighbors, they'll go anywhere they can go to bring food and put it in front of you. Because if they run out of food, they're shamed, it impacts their standing in the culture, it impacts who their children will and will not be able to marry, it impacts their businesses, it impacts their ability to, uh, to recruit and gather people to help them gather in their crops, it changes everything for them. So, John chapter 2, Jesus goes to a wedding. You probably know the story, but I want to warn you that sometimes the stories we know best are the ones that are most, that are easiest for us to miss what God is really saying to us. As I read, I'm going to walk through the passage, and I want to walk you through the story, and then when we finish that, I want to come back to some takeaways from the story. On The Bible says, John chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. On the third day. Now, you can't help but hear that without thinking of the resurrection, can you? I believe John's intentionally doing that. John is a gospel writer that is the deepest of all the gospel writers. If you're just coming to Christ or you're exploring the faith, John is a great book to start in. But it's also the gospel that that has so many different layers to it that as you pull it back, it's, it's such an amazing book. It's an amazing work of literature. John here in the very first, uh, very second chapter of his book introduces this phrase, on the third day. We'll see that it won't be very long before Jesus will be talking about the resurrection itself. John's just giving us a little bit of foreshadowing, if you will, on the third day. The third day uh, after what? Well, the third day after he has met Nathaniel and Nathaniel's friends as recorded in John chapter 1. But John says it specifically this way to point us forward to the resurrection that is coming. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. A wedding would be a week-long feast, seven days long, and during that, and it was a party. It was, um, it was designed to draw the entire community in. It's very different in our day. The way that you prove that you're married is you have a piece of paper that is notarized by the government or is signed by the minister and the, and the county officials that verify that you're married. In the first century, the way that you verify that you are married is you say, y'all remember, all of y'all were there. I mean, the whole community comes out, and many times there would be people there who didn't really necessarily know the family, but the whole community would come, and it is the host family's job, uh, the groom's family, it is their job to provide everything for all of these people who will come. Mary and his and Jesus and his disciples go to this wedding. It's anywhere from 5 to 15 miles from where they live, but they're invited. They're expected to be there, to be witnesses to this ceremony, so that if there ever is any legal question as to whether these two people are married, that the entire community can answer with a resounding yes, these two people are married. The ceremony was very short, and the party was really long. And so they would party for seven days or so, and they would have a feast, and the whole community would come together for this. So there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Notice that John doesn't mention her by name. Nowhere in the Gospel of John is Jesus' mother called by her name, Mary. Now, we know who Jesus' mother is. John knew who Jesus' mother was, and this is good evidence to us that those who were reading the Gospel of John for the first time somewhere in the late first century A.D., they knew who Jesus' mother was. It's Mary. This is a way for John to honor Jesus' mother. In other words, it's like saying this, uh, Jesus' mother, now I don't have to tell her, tell you her name because you know her well. It's a way of indicating that she is so well known and so honored among the church that she doesn't even need to be mentioned by name. So John says, the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, we got a problem. The wine ran out. Now, archaeologists have found Cana in Galilee. They've done some digging there, and they have found uh, Welch's grape juice bottles, which proves to us that this was, in fact, uh, as Baptists have imagined it, the grape juice ran out. That's a joke, by the way. Don't um, quote me on that. 
I do want to just for a moment address this issue of wine. We get real uncomfortable as Baptists when we talk about wine. Let me just say this. Jesus did drink wine. Uh, Jesus made wine out of water. He turned water into wine. But yes, the wine was very different in the first century. Wine was fermented, not distilled. It was fermented because if it were not fermented in a controlled environment, it very quickly ruined in the first century climate. And wine was the preferred drink uh, over water. It wasn't that they didn't have access to good, clean water. There's lots of good, clean drinking water in all of, of, what, of most of what it's called Israel, uh, it's that wine tastes better than water. Uh, that's just the way it works. You say, well, yeah, but, I, but I, I've always been told that it was a different kind of wine. It is a different kind of wine, and it's very, it's actually impossible. It's not difficult to know. It's impossible to know exactly how they mixed the wine with the water, but they did. Uh, there, there are records that indicate that wine is almost always mixed with water, a significant amount of water. To drink wine without mixing it with water was seen as very dangerous because of what it could lead to. Drunkenness was frowned upon in Judaism just as it is in Christianity. And so uh, good, uh, faithful Jews would have stayed way away from anything that would, uh, including Jesus, would have stayed from any, away from anything that would have any way make him intoxicated at any level. It brings the question, though, as many have asked, well, pastor, should we drink alcohol? I'm going to give you the short answer, no. And then I'll give you a little longer answer. So, Pastor, you're taking my freedom away. Now, you asked me. You didn't really, but you did in your mind. And so you asked me, and I gave you my opinion. I'll tell you this. I can take you from Genesis to Revelation, and I'll, I want to be absolutely clear. Nowhere in Scripture does it come anywhere close to saying, Thou shalt not drink alcohol. That's not in anywhere from Genesis to Revelation. However, what I can tell you is that wisdom cries out in the streets. Leave the stuff alone. In fact, I'll say this. We've taken one little verse, take a little wine for your stomach, and we've used that, and we've twisted it into party like it's 1999. <laughs> and God's okay with it. Now, does God, is it a sin to drink alcohol? No, it is not. But I can guarantee that you will never drink too much alcohol and therefore get into sin if you never pick it up. And I have yet to have anybody come to me and say, here's a really good reason why I should drink alcohol. Pastor, my doctor says that I should drink a little bit of wine. Have you asked him if there are alternatives to drinking wine that will accomplish the exact same thing as drinking wine? Because the answer to that question is yes. So I've yet to have anybody come to me and say, here's a really good reason why I have to drink some alcohol. But I can give you a list a thousand reasons long why you should not drink the stuff. I can also give you personal testimony from my family of 42 funerals on my mother's side directly caused by alcohol. That side of our family is almost completely non-existent, including her three younger brothers, directly because of alcohol. Some of you know, many of you know the story of my brother who until two years ago was in a 15-year addiction to alcohol. It started at the end of a tour through the Jack Daniels Distillery in Tennessee when he, at 25 years old, took a sip of alcohol at the end of that tour that was offered to him as a free sample. He said it was like a switch that was flipped, and I could not put the stuff down. And that started a 15-year alcoholic cycle in his life that took away from him everything that he cared about. Praise God, yes, two years ago, we thought would be our four, we thought would be the 43rd funeral on my mother's side of the family turned from a funeral into a resurrection, and we thank God for that. But we can't get those 15 years back, and he can't get those 15 years back, and his family can't get those 15 years back. The other thing that I know, knowing that is my genetic history. My children, at some point in their lives, will make their own decision. But I would really hate for their testimony to be, you know, there was a day when mom and dad left the house, and I knew where they hid their liquor. And I went in and I got a sip. And that started an addiction for me that to this day has hung with me. You say, well, 
Again, the Bible doesn't say it's sin, drink alcohol. I, I agree. And pastor, I don't have the genetic history that your family has. You do not know whether you have that genetic history or not. And you certainly don't know whether your children have it. You know what you do not know what you're exposing your children to. So when you take the thousand reasons why you ought to stay away from it, it is my opinion that wisdom cries out in the street that in the 21st century American culture that we live in, stay away from the stuff. It's just best. Young people, stay away from the stuff. Just don't even go there. Don't even, don't even pretend to go there. Don't even get anywhere, anywhere near it. It adds nothing to your life, but it could absolutely take everything from you. So yes, when the wine ran out, Jesus, the mother of Jesus, said to him, they have no wine. I want you to notice, very similar to chapter 1, when, when it would be, it would be um, not right, it would be out of step for a woman, even though she's the mother of Jesus, it would be to come especially to a rabbi and to ask him for something. To ask him, in, especially in this context, for something like this. And so, uh, again, she doesn't want to break the norms of the day, so she just simply comes to him and states the issue. They have no wine. And this is very similar to when the disciples come to Jesus and they say, where are you staying? They hope that Jesus will say, why don't you come see? But they wouldn't dare ask if they could go to his home. And so she comes to him and says, they have no wine. Jesus gives this really bizarre answer. I once had a teenager ask if he could memorize this verse and quote it to his mother in the morning when she came to wake him up for school. Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. I said, no. You can't, and then I said, you know what, knowing his mom, I said, hold on, just wait a second. Yes, and please let me know how that goes. I'd love to know how that works out for you. But it's a, it's a bizarre response, isn't it? Now hold on to that response. We're going to come back to it. I do want to let you know that when Jesus says that to his mother woman, it's not, he's not being disrespectful. There are other words that he could use that would be more endearing that he could use uh, that, to address his own mom, but he's not being disrespectful. He's addressing her as he would politely any other woman in the culture. He is in some way distancing himself as her son, as though I believe to say in the text of Scripture to say to us that she is first his disciple and she is secondly his mother. So Jesus says, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Hold on to that response. We're going to come back to it at the very end because it is something amazing that Jesus is telling us in this moment. His mother, verse 5, said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Do you see both the respect for Jesus and the faith. Do whatever he tells you. In other words, mom doesn't say, now come on, Jesus, they've run out of wine. These are our good friends. We don't want them in a bad spot. We don't, you know, I know you can do something about this. I've seen what you can do. Just do whatever he says. Submission. If he does something, he does something. If he doesn't do anything, he doesn't do anything. But also faith. There's a anticipation in Mary's statement that Jesus is going to fix this. Do whatever he says. And indeed, Jesus does fix it. Now, there were, verse 6, six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of uh, purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. These stone jars uh, would have been very common in households and certainly very common at a party like this where you expected many people to come over several days. And these stone jars, we're told, hold 20 to 30 gallons each. So these are, these are large jars. Stone was considered something that uh, was sacred and would not make something that was clean, unclean. And so these jars were set aside for this ritual. And ritually clean water would be poured in this jar so that a Jewish people would come along for what was most likely hand-washing rituals. Hand-washing rituals were very elaborate in those days, and they would want to make sure that nothing unclean ever touched the hand after it was ritually clean. This is not about hand-washing the way that we wash hands in order to get germs off of our hands, although the Lord was very kind to, uh, to tell us about many things ahead of time, but that's not what they have in mind. Uh, what, what they're doing here is they're saying, this hand is unclean. 
And I want to make it ritually clean before I touch food and I put, before I touch clean, a food that is ritually clean and put it into my body so that I will not become ritually unclean. And so they would go through elaborate hand washing rituals and different groups had different ways of doing this, but mainly they would want to make sure that they held their hand up and that they poured water over this hand so that this hand would now be clean. They wouldn't hold it down because if they poured it here and this part is unclean, then it would run down and now this hand is unclean. So it's got to be held up and the water would run over this hand and the clean water now touches this hand and it is now clean. Then they would take this hand, hold this hand up and pour the water over the top of it. And now this hand is made ritually clean by that water. And there were six of these here. They were very large, which means there were many Jewish people there who were going through these rituals and the host expected that many people would be going through these hand-washing rituals over the different days of the feast. And so Jesus says, take these stone jars, verse 7, fill the jars with water and fill them up to the brim. Now it is no mistake that Jesus chose these stone jars. Don't miss the statement of Jesus here. Although this story is certainly about Jesus' ability to make wine out of water, it is about so much more. Jesus is taking something used under the old covenant for purification and he's saying we're about to repurpose these jars that are used for these purification rituals. We're about to take what was symbolic of what I'm going to do and we're going to transform it and change it into something. We're going to take this water in these jars and transform it into wine. And Jesus says, after he's told them to fill it up, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. The master of the feast would likely not have been a servant. He would have been someone of fairly high rank in the culture. And he's someone chosen either by the host himself or even sometimes by those attending the feast. It's like a ceremonial position. But his job was to make sure that no one drank too much, that no one got inebriated at the feast, that if someone had too much food and someone had too little food, that the distribution was made so that no dishonor was brought to the host. It was his job to assign the seats. So you've heard Jesus speak about this at feast, that where you're going to sit means something. So he would be the one who would go to someone who set themselves a little too high up at a table and say, hey, I need you to move down and we're going to move this person uh, up a little higher. So this host was a very prominent person in the culture and again, either chosen by the host or chosen by the people who were attending the feast, and his job would last for all seven days of the feast. So he's not a servant. And Jesus says to the servant, take this water, draw it out, and bring it to the master of the feast. The Bible says, verse 9, when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from. John wants us to know. The master of the feast didn't know. The bridegroom did not know. He goes out of his way to highlight, this guy has no clue where this wine came from. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. This is not, as some have said, well, once everybody's good and drunk, we can slip the good stuff in. Again, these feasts are not about drunkenness. These feasts are not about everybody getting together and getting it so inebriated they can't recognize when it's bad alcohol. These are feasts that last seven days. Even if you get drunk on day one, by day four, you would hopefully have sobered up from it. It's not about that. It's about the host saying, I'm going to put my best foot forward at the beginning of the feast, and I hope the good wine will last. And if not, I'll start to search the cupboards everywhere that I can. I'll start to pull out everything that I can because I certainly don't want to run out of wine. I'll even go to my neighbor's house if I have to and get some wine. And so the quality of wine goes down as the feast goes on simply because the host is trying not to run out. But the master of the feast says, you saved the best wine until now. Rather than come to verse 10 and have a discussion about whether or not we ought to be able to drink wine and how much we ought to be able to drink, we've missed the point altogether. Many people will come to this passage and say, see these people at this feast, Jesus just gave them more wine to get even more drunk. And I don't think that's what's going on here at all. But I will tell you this, we have missed the point of this passage. 
We have missed what John is saying to us and what Jesus is saying to us through this story. He is saying to us, you have saved the best until now. The old covenant was good. And that water that represents the purification was good. But something new is here and it is better. You have saved the best until now. Verse 11, this, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. If you've studied the Gospel of John, you know that there are seven signs in the Gospel of John. They are miracles, but John doesn't use the word miracles. Matthew, Mark, and Luke will use the word miracles. John uses the word signs. And these signs of John, they, there are seven of them. Although Jesus performs many miracles in the Gospel of John, there are only seven signs, seven things that point to something. What are they pointing to? John tells us right here in chapter 1. They manifest the glory of Jesus. They point to the glory of Jesus. They point to who Jesus is. And this sign is no different. It is the first of them. And Jesus uses it to manifest his glory and then here it is. His disciples believed in him. His disciples had faith in him. This is that first time in the Gospel of John that we have somebody placing faith in Jesus using this language, this statement. This statement that will become so important to John. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him. These things are written to you that you might believe. Blessed are you because uh, you have believed because you have seen. Blessed are those who believe because they have not seen. This idea of believing, of placing faith in becomes so important to John and here it is first introduced to us in chapter 2 and then the story concludes in verse 12. After this he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples and they stayed there for a few days. Those who believe in Jesus find full and abundant life. That's what I want you to see in this text. This passage, those who believe in Jesus find full and abundant life. Why? Really quickly, I want to show you three reasons, and you've seen them all already. First, when we believe, we experience the grace of Jesus. I want you to think about what happened between the time those jars sat there being used for old covenant purification rituals and the time that Jesus transforms that water into wine. What happens? First, we have these stone jars that were used for purification. Now they are being used for mercy. They used for this elaborate ritual that's three or four degrees away from what God intended in the first place in their purification rituals, but still they're upholding these rituals that were based in the old covenant rituals, and so it's being used for purification. And trust me, it's, it's quite upsetting. It would have been quite upsetting to the religious elite at this feast if they knew that Jesus had taken these jars set aside and that water set aside for these purposes, and he had turned it into wine. They would have said, you're violating God's uh, standards of holiness. You're, you're, in a, you're in a bad place, Jesus. I can't believe you did this to these sacred vessels, although God himself never set them aside as sacred. And Jesus takes these vessels used for purification. And he turns them into vessels of mercy. He says, there's a man here who's about to lose everything. There's a man here, if the wine runs out, He'll lose his standing in this culture. We don't know if Jesus knew the man or not or if he was simply invited because of who he was. But Jesus looks at this man in his situation and he chooses mercy over sacrifice. That's how he would word it later in his teaching. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. So Jesus uses these jars intended for purification, and he repurposes them for mercy. These jars that were filled at regular levels, Jesus says, fill them to the brim. Just as the old covenant was a beautiful sign of who God was, but the new covenant is even better. It reminds us of John chapter 1, 16 through 17. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. What that passage is saying is that the law was good, but boy, wait till you hear about Jesus. Grace upon grace. The old covenant here, the new covenant, filled to the brim with the goodness 
of God. And then there are jars filled with water that are now filled with wine. We drink mostly water at our house. A few years ago, our oldest son, Jackson, uh, was standing in the kitchen. and He said to the other kids, guys, have y'all tried water with ice? It's amazing. <laughs> at that point, I told Lindsay, maybe we're being a little too strict on our children. Maybe we need to let them experience a little bit more of life. <laughs> Man, water with ice. Water's good. Wine is better. Water is good. It tastes good. It gets the job done. But wine is better. Water is something that is used in an everyday basis. Wine is something for celebrating. In every way, Jesus is saying the new covenant is superior to the old covenant and we experience the grace of Jesus. Do you know that we can be new covenant Christians living with an old covenant mindset? See, there are some of you here who haven't experienced the grace and mercy of God and you don't know what that's like. And I want you to come to faith in Jesus and I want you to experience the grace and mercy of God. I would have you experience it because then you'll know what it means to be forgiven, to be right with God and to, to be in right step with God. But then there are some of us who know the Lord, but from time to time we start to forget that God loves us because of who we are and because of who he's made us to be and because he's brought us into his family and not because of what we have done. Not because we've earned what he's done for us. We've not earned our way into God's family. We've been graciously welcomed into God's family. Some of you think, well, if I, if I don't do the right things, if I don't come to church, if I don't check all the boxes, then I won't be in God's family anymore. You didn't earn your way in. You can't work your way out. God has brought you into his family. You are born again. You are at the table and you can no longer, uh, you, you can no more cease to be his son and daughter than your own son or daughter could cease to be your son or daughter. You have been born again into the kingdom of God and you're a part of it. And you know what? God's not sad that he brought you in. Did you know that? God's not in heaven going, man, I tell you, we shouldn't have let that one in. He knew the day he saved you. He knew every time you'd stumble. He knew every failure. He knew every mistake. He knew sin that is in your heart that you don't even know is there. And he still brought you into the family. Why? Because the new covenant is a covenant of grace. You say, why would God do that? He does it because he is God and he is gracious. And you say, but it doesn't make any sense. I haven't earned that and I can't understand why he would do it. And I can't see any reason in my life why he would have saved me in the first place. And I certainly can't see any reason why he would keep me in the family. And that is exactly the point. That's the point of grace. So that you come into a place like this and even more so you gather with the saints for all of eternity and you fall at the feet of Almighty God and you say, I cannot understand a grace and a mercy and a love like this one. And you worship him for 10,000 upon 10,000 years and you still can't understand how it is that you deserve the grace and mercy of God. That's the point of it. If you ever got to the point where you said, well, I'll tell you what, I see why God keeps me in this family. And you've really missed it. I'll tell you another thing. If you try to live out a covenant of grace, under an understanding of a covenant of law, you will fail. Fear will keep you motivated, but only for so long. There comes a time when there's not enough fear in the world, fear of punishment, fear of whatever, to keep you from stepping into sin. But if you will dive into grace, so here's the lie. The lie is, hey, pastor, you start preaching grace, you start pe preaching grace, and people are going to start sinning left and right. And some will, some will, in their immaturity, some even in their spiritual lostness, will, will take a view of grace and they'll say, well, God will forgive me. I'm going to live my life however I want to, and God has to forgive me. That is a false understanding of grace. But if you really understand that God has saved you, and that before the foundation of the world, God determined to send his son to die in your place. Before you had done anything, either good or bad. Before you had even walked one day on this earth, God decided to 
crucify his own son to pay for your sins. When you understand that and wrap your mind around that, and then he reached down at some point, like like he did for me when I was a six-year-old little boy. What did I understand as a six-year-old little boy? People say, you couldn't under, have understood enough of the gospel at six years old to be saved. Can I tell you this? I still can't understand enough of the gospel to be saved. It's not about how much you understand. It's not about how much you do. It is simply about God saving you. And you respond in faith. And when you do that, everything changes. And when you understand that, see, fear will motivate you to do what God wants you to do for the short, short term. But when you understand what I'm talking about, you will go to the ends of the earth and you will spend your last breath for a Savior and a Father who have done everything for you. When you were a kid, I bet you got away with whatever your parents would let you get away with. It doesn't make you bad. It makes you a kid. But as you grow to maturity, you begin, if you had good parents and godly parents, to want to honor them and serve them because of all they have done for you. The same is true of our relationship with God. When we're spiritually immature, we try to get away with whatever we can get away with. But when we understand grace, grace becomes not our license to sin. It becomes our motivator for obedience. And there is no greater motivator than grace. Secondly, when we believe, we experience the power of Jesus. Very quickly, those who attended the wedding knew nothing about this miracle. The higher-ups knew nothing about this miracle. Those who were at the feast knew nothing about this. Who did know? Well, Mary knew. Mary knew, and she expresses faith in this. Remember when she says... Do whatever he says. That's an expression of faith. The servants knew. The servants expressed faith. You say, I don't see in there where the servants expressed faith. They dipped that cup in that water. They took it to the master of the feast and they handed him a cup and said, here, drink this. If that's not wine, they're in big trouble. First of all, it's water. And the master of the ceremony, the master of the feast, is going to be upset with these Servants who have no standing in culture to defend themselves. They're simply servants. This guy is a high-ranking guy. But secondly, where did that water come from? It came from the purification jars. Why did you hand me a cup of water? Where did this water come from? You took water out of the stone jars and brought it to me to drink? So yeah, they expressed faith. Jesus, what did Mary say? Do whatever he says. What did the service do? Whatever he said. They go, they dip the cup out, they take it to the master of the ceremony. It is not until he drinks that the Bible tells us that we even know the water now become wine. We don't know exactly when it turned into wine, but we see the servants express faith. And then we see the disciples they see this, it manifests his glory, and they believe. So when we believe, we experience the power of Jesus. Now, this miracle becomes known later. That's clear from the text. It's clear later as we read into the Gospel of John. But in this moment, everybody at the party uh, thinks, man, what a great feast, what a great ceremony, what a great host, what a great bride, what a great bridegroom. But nobody understands that 2,000 years later, we would be talking about this wedding for a very different reason. None of them saw it. But the servants did. Mary did. The disciples did. When we believe, we experience the power of Jesus. I wish it were this way. I wish it were that God gives you everything you need and then says, I'm going to ask you to step out in faith. He doesn't do that. <laughs> what God says is follow me, trust me, believe in me, and then he just doesn't fail. He just doesn't fail to provide. But he provides in the moment when you need it, Sometimes people will say to Lindsay and I, I wish I could experience some of the things that you talk about when you talk about church planting and you talk about living on the mission field and you see what God did on the mission field and they say, man, I wish I could experience some things like that. And, and, I, and I listen, I, I hear you and I know, I, I wish you could experience them too. But you need to understand with those experiences, when those experiences happened, we were 
not out on a limb. Uh, we, were all, we were over the edge. We weren't about to go over the cliff. We had already jumped off, and we were on our way down saying, God, if you don't do something, we're in big trouble. That's where we were when these things came through. You're not going to experience God when you're 30 feet back from the cliff of faith, and you're saying, you know what, God, if you'll build a bridge there, I'll walk across it. You're going to experience God when God says, I just need you to go. And you go, and God provides. When you believe, you experience the power of Jesus. Finally, when we believe in Jesus, we experience the glory of Jesus. I think what is often missed in this passage is that Jesus is performing a miracle that makes a statement. That's what a sign is, a miracle that makes a statement. Through this miracle, the Bible says Jesus manifested his glory. What does that mean? It tells us, means that he showed us the nature of who he is. Go back to John chapter 1, verse 14. We have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father. Jesus is revealing who he is. You know, all the way back to the first, to the second century A.D., somewhere around 120 A.D., we have record of a prayer. And we don't have record before that because many of the records were lost in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. But there's a good chance that if we go back to 120 AD and this prayer has been, is being prayed, that is still being prayed today, there is a good chance that this prayer is the same kind of prayer that would have been prayed in Jesus' day. If not in Jesus' day, then shortly thereafter. This is the prayer of blessing over the cup that is still prayed today. If you go to a Passover Seder, you'll hear this prayer prayed both in Hebrew and in English. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. What did Jesus do in this moment? Jesus created the fruit of the vine. This is the first of these seven miracles where Jesus will prove himself to be the one who creates the fruit of the vine, the one who brings forth the fruit of the earth, the one who is the light of the world, the one who brings life where there is death. He will prove himself to be God in the flesh, and this is the first of those. And you know, it really doesn't cost Jesus anything to do this, does it? Jesus is God. What is it for God to turn water into wine? It's really nothing. What is it for God to open the eyes of a blind man? Nothing. The one who created those eyes. What is it for God to part the Red Sea? It's his breath. It's a thought. It costs God nothing to do these miracles that we read about. However, there is a great cost that comes with Jesus stepping to earth and manifesting his glory. And I want to take you back to what he told his mother. The mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. The gospel of John is very clear. And Jesus' hour is the hour of his death. And in this moment, this first public sign, this first action of public ministry when Jesus steps out into ministry at Cana in Galilee, when he takes that step into ministry, he takes the first step toward the cross. My hour has not yet come, but Jesus does it anyway. And he knows that this first step will lead to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, until he will tell his disciples, my hour is at hand. If a seed does not fall to the ground and die, it cannot bring forth fruit. John chapter 12, verse 23. And Jesus will do just that. He will die, and then he will bring forth the fruit of the resurrection. Even in John chapter 2, the hour has come. Mary didn't fully understand it. The disciples didn't fully understand it. The servants didn't know it. The, the bridegroom, the master of the ceremony, did not know it. But God in the flesh stands here at Cana in the Galilee, in Galilee, bringing forth the fruit of the vine and proclaiming that his hour is coming. The time would come when Jesus would pay for the only miracle that ever cost him anything, the miracle of salvation. He would lay down his life and freely give all of that so that you and I could be saved. Crucified on Friday, resurrected on the third day, on Sunday, so that you and I could be forgiven our sins and be saved. 
for our time of response today, we're going to do it a little differently. I'm going to ask, I'm going to pray in just a moment, and then I'm going to ask you to stay seated. And we're going to, we're going to sing, but mainly I want you to just listen. I want you to listen to a song called New Wine. That in the crushing and in the pressing, God is making new wine. It's what he did through Jesus. It's what he wants to do through us. If the Lord leads you, you get up out of your seat and you come and you pray. Our pastors and prayer counselors will be ready. But I want you mainly to listen. And I want you to make this song your prayer. And then we'll have a second time of response. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity you've given us to be together as your people. Lord, I pray as we move into a time of response that you would work in hearts and lives all across this room. And Lord, even those who are watching online, God, do your work in us. Do whatever it is that you brought us here to do. We trust you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm.